Mm. Yeah. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Hi everyone, my name is Jennifer Nichols and I'm the Executive Director of the Institute of Architects and it's really lovely to have you all here with us tonight. Um, we've enjoyed a weekend and kind of a week of um, being able to welcome people both in person and also virtually. Tonight there's a huge group of you joining us virtually and just a few in the room, so welcome everyone. Um, I respectfully acknowledge the um, traditional and original owners of this land, the Lutruwita people, and elders past and present. So tonight you're here joining us for our Open House Hobart Speaker Series. And this particular um, talk or conversation tonight is titled, and here I might stumble, <laughs> Remembering the Vandemonium Primitive, the Social and Architectural History of Boson's Cottage. Tonight we are joined by the owners of Boson's Cottage, Alison and Doug Bridge. Welcome both of you and also thank you so much for so generously opening your home on the weekend. We really appreciate it. And Matt Hines and Poppy um, Taylor of Taylor and Hines Architects. And Matt will discuss the architectural and social particularities of a small archetypal colonial Georgian cottage in Oatlands. Bozen's Cottage, its social history and architectural adaptation to contemporary circumstances and needs. Um, Matt, for many of you won't need much of an introduction, um, but Matt, um, Matt is very familiar to us um, and we love his contribution to our local community, our local architectural community. For the, those of you who don't know him as well, Matt received his architectural education in both Tasmania and abroad and is a registered architect in Tasmania and has been since 2011. He's, he has held teaching and associate lecturing and examiner positions at the University of Tasmania for over a decade and has taught in a number of institutions internationally. In 2010, he established his practice with his partner, Poppy Taylor. The work of Taylor and Hines is recognised nationally for its poetic, considered and rigorous ideation and execution. The practice is internationally, nas nationally and locally awarded. In 2018, he was awarded the Australian Institute of Architects Emerging Architects Prize for his contribution to the profession. Most recently, and there have been numerous other awards along the way, but Taylor and Hines jointly received the Lachlan Macquarie Award for Heritage, the highest award for heritage architecture at the National Australian Institute of Architects National Architecture Awards for this project, Bozen's Cottage. Welcome, Matt. Thank you, Thank you Jen. Um, so the way that we thought we'd do this is that Doug is going to present the social history of the cottage first, and then I essentially respond with the architectural narrative um, after that. So the first thing I, I think it worth saying to introduce Doug and, and Alison, they purchased Bosons um, uh, or, uh, in 2017 and approached us and um, there's a very good story about how they engaged us because I was unsure about the commission but Doug told us that we had no choice. So <laughs> we we were going to do it hell or high water. And um, it has turned out to be one of the most extraordinary and fulfilling projects that Poppy and I have undertaken. There are times in um, professional life when, particularly in the field that we are engaged in, where you pour yourself into the work with a view that, and it can feel like an abyss, and then it, and then it turns on you and presents back to you a voice which resonates um, for a career and Poppy and I are very sure that this little project will do that for us and we hope also that it does it for our audience. So here's two exceptional clients and I'd like to invite Doug so you can talk to the first part of the presentation. You just flick through the, on the arrows there. Okay. Evening everybody. So I think the 
most interesting part of the history for um, my wife and I was that as we um, explored the local history of um, Boson's Cottage, it kind of reshaped our understanding of um, Tasmanian past. The cottage is cited in the um, context of Australia's colonisation and it was built in Oatlands, which was a fairly large um, penal centre, penal administration centre in Tasmania. And the history of the building is linked with systematic violence against uh, Van Neeman's lands, traditional owners, transported convicts and the natural environment. So we sort of characterised it as a small cottage and a tiny link in a very large chain of 19th century British imperialism. Now, there's a photograph there of the cottage in the um, early 20th century, and you might notice there are no telegraph poles or um, wires or anything like that. Um, there are four significant sorts of phases um, that we uncovered during the history. The first is associated with the colonial history uh, of the cottage up to um, the end of uh, convict transportation. Um, the second period of his history I've nominated as the interregnum, it's, it's between uh, the period between the end of uh, convict transportation and um, the beginning of federation, federation in Australia. And that was a period of tremendous economic turmoil and the cottage during that time um, reflected that, that sort of turmoil. And then um, for the 20th century, there was a, a, a very stable, um, traditional Tasmanian family that owned the cottage until we bought it. So they owned it from um, 1903 until 2017. It's important to note that before European history, there is a, a, a vast history associated with um, the local um, communities that lived in, in um, Van Diemen's land. Um, I think you can see what's, what's written there. Uh, most significantly, perhaps, is that in the 1820s there was a rapid expansion of European settlement into Van Diemen's Land. And at that stage, local ab Aboriginals had their traditional corridors of travel and their hunting grounds really disrupted and, uh, and or stolen. And um, there are, are many historians who consider that this period uh, involved quite a significant um, guerrilla war, really, uh, where the Aboriginal communities tried to maintain their, their ways of life. Um, you can see uh, on the map on the, on the side there the um, black line which was uh, initiated by Governor Arthur to try and um, find and herd up all of the Aboriginal communities in, um, in, in Tasmania. And Oatlands is the, the red dot in the middle of that. You can see it is absolutely in the centre of all of that kind of um, historic uh, horror. Between 1803 and 1853, there were about 750,000 uh, convicts served time in Van Diemen's land. And George Arthur um, ruled Dan's Van Diemen's land uh, initially and he was very influenced by Jeremy Bentham's philosophy of utilitarianism. And he developed a per very persuasive um, surveillance system, constructing the island as a kind of panopticon. And he used free settlers as um, instruments in that, in that uh, observation and oversight of, of convicts. And um, Oatlands was integral to this kind of um, structure and uh, Bo's cottage, Bozen's cottage, had uh, a key role in the penal system. The first Oatlands jail, jail was built from logs uh, and begun in about 1827. And Joseph Masters was one of the first um, jailers who was employed to work at the, uh, at the prison. The prison wasn't really very um, stable. People could escape from it really easily and, and so on. And, um, uh, Joseph's wife was a, um, a good time girl and she had lots of wild parties with the various um, convicts that were incarcerated in the, in the log jail. And as a consequence, um, Masters uh, wasn't 
given the, the land that uh, the cottage is, is um, built on, even though we have a map that indicates um, uh, at some stage the colonial administration was considering uh, granting the land to Joseph Masters. When we bought the cottage, we uh, found that we had um, a deed signed by Sir John Franklin um, granting the land to uh, Jane Payne. And that was the beginning of our history uh, of the cottage associated with co colonialism. The Payne family were really an interesting sort of family. Um, their life in Tasmania was almost uh, Dickensian in the, in the way it, it unfolded. They were free settlers and we think religious dissenters. They were, were Wesleyans. And they arrived in um, Tasmania on the Callista in 1827. Um, we haven't got any idea of when Jane uh, and her family um, th and, and the other children arrived, but we know that uh, John Payne arrived on the Callista. That's recorded in, in, in the um, histri historical documents that we could get hold of. In 18, they lived in Hobart and um, John was a carpenter. And in 1834, he was sentenced to seven years transportation uh, in Tasmania. That meant that he was um, sentenced to uh, uh, time at Port Arthur because he was um, accused of stealing some timber, some dried timber that he then used in, in the development of his own, of his own house. Uh, there's a lot of newspaper reports about this particular event and John um, was a very highly thought of um, moral character and uh, there was reporting that perhaps he was being treated very, very um, harshly by, by the administration. Anyway, we um, then found that in 1837 Jane bought the, the property on behalf of her, her family. I'll just have to look forward and see what I said then. And um, that interested Ali and I because when we, we first knew that it was a woman who had owned the cottage in um, Oaklands, we thought, oh, wow, this is really fantastic. Um, you know, what, what, what's the story behind this, this um, event? She was 71 years old when she bought the cottage as well. So we wondered whether she was... Um, uh, a particularly astute businesswoman or whether she was rewarded in some way by the, the people that she'd been working with and, you know, all of the sort of 21st century ideas that you might have about, about a woman in, in, the, in that circumstance. But we think that the reality of the circumstance was much more mundane and Jane probably bought the property on behalf of her family because convicted um, people were not allowed to own property. And so John, having been sentenced to um, uh, transportation, wasn't able to buy land at all. Um, and we also surmise that perhaps the family moved to Oaklands to escape the sort of stigma associated with them in, in Hobart. So by 1843, we've got um, census data that nominates John as the head of the, of the family, but Jane as the propri proprietor of the property. Here's a, a map by um, Calder around 1844 of Jane's um, property. In red is the, the stone cottage uh, that still, is still standing there. And the brown things are timber uh, buildings that were associated with the, the uh, property. We think probably a kitchen and um, maybe a dairy or something like that. And the little orangey bit at the back was um, a shed of some sort. Uh, Jane's buried not very far from the cottage and um, we go and have a look at her gravestone every now and again. So uh, Jane's son John, um, when, he, when they moved to Oaklands, we we're assuming that he was involved in the, the building of the cottage. But by uh, the mid-18th um, century, uh, both John Payne and his wife were working um, in the prison at, at Oaklands. So an ex-prisoner became a, a prison keeper. Um, they were required to live on site while they were uh, working at the, at the jail and consequently we think that's the reason why they sold um, uh, Boson's Cottage to John, New uh, John Newby 
in 1857. I'm going to jump a little bit, but um, this is Adam Pennicott, who came out to um, Tasmania as a convict, and his uh, crime was horse stealing, and he came out um, and was resident in Oaklands, and for some period of time between 1857 and 1901 um, was resident in the cottage as a tenant, uh, but not as, as the owner of the cottage. So he's the great-great-great-grandfather of the Pennycott um, dynasty. Um, George Pennycott was his, his son, and George and um, Annie both lived in, in our cottage, and um, uh, they were involved in um, purchasing the cottage. We know that George actually uh, bought the cottage at the turn of the, of the century. We're not sure whether he was living in it before he bought it as well, but we know that he did. He, did. Um, his, his, he had a heap of children, but the, the um, son of his that stayed on in the cottage was Frank, and um, Frank and Alice uh, owned the cottage in the 40s and 50s, and a little bit earlier than that. Frank was um, a soldier in the Second World War, and when he came back to Tasmania, he was working in a, a timber mill. And um, at one stage, in I think in about 1947, 1950-ish, he was asked to go and help one of his neighbours who had got a shot when she touched her um, water tank. So he went to help and he was killed with, the, um, with an electric shock. So after that, Alice and um, the family stayed in the cottage and George and his wife moved in with them as well. Um, Frank and Alice's um, son that, that kept the cottage was um, Bose and Stuart Pennicott, and he's the guy that we bought the, the cottage from. Um, Bo was a local character. He was very involved in the church uh, up in Oatlands. Um, he lived there alone. And it was during his uh, tenancy of the cottage that it pretty well fell apart. Um, he, in fact, didn't own the cottage. His family kind of loaned it to him. So I don't think he felt uh, compelled to um, do any work on it. So when we bought the cottage, we, uh, because it had, hadn't been sold since 1903, um, the cottage had never been transferred to the Torrance system of titling. So we got a box with all of the deeds from um, every person who had owned the, the cottage all the way um, from uh, 1837 through to uh, 2017. And that's, how, that's the sort of coat hangers that we've been able to use to um, piece together a fairly complete history of the, of the building. Um, we've worked very hard to make sure that everybody in Oatlands really um, is happy with the kind of work that we're doing with the cottage because although it was kind of falling apart, um, it, it's significant to a lot of the neighbours and a lot of the people in a very small community and a lot of the people knew Bo really well and they have been they've really kept their eye on what Ali and I have been doing in the cottage and around the cottage. So there's just a, a note from the Pennicott family. Um, when we bought the cottage, they sent that um, to us, um, you know, hoping that we will have as good a time in the, in the house as, as they had. Everybody read that? So there's the cottage... Um, before we bought it, you can see it's in a pretty dilapidated kind of state. Um, one wall was falling down and um, parts of that wall and parts of the um, 20th century additions to the building had been um, made with um, asbestos sheeting, so we had a lot of difficulty sorting it out. This is the first night that Ali and I slept at the cottage. What you can't see there is a roaring fire in the, in the fireplace at our feet. And we found that um, mattress out in one of the sheds. And it wasn't until um, sort of early in the morning that we realised that the mattress had probably been home to a few mice and, and rats as well. It was a very, 
me left out of bed quite quick. <laughs> Here you can see the um, the state of the the cottage. I mean, this is when building and and so on hadn't begun, but we were pulling things down. And um, on the right hand side, that's the um, ceiling in the lounge room. And Ali and I went up there uh, when we had a very heavy downpour um, in that year in Hobart to find the whole house really flooded with with water it was just pouring through the through the ceiling. More photographs. So we've kept those light shades, probably 1940s or 50s, they suit the house. And that's what it looks like um, currently. So is that all right, Matt? Thank you, Doug. So I'm going to just read really essentially a testimony of the work that we did subsequent to being engaged by Alison and Doug to help them re-enliven the cottage. Um, so you can already see that it came with a lot of background and understanding about the sensitivities of what the fabric meant. So um, we approached it with a very careful um, sensibility. We're very mindful of tradition in our work, almost to the extent that we feel we are only ever clarifying and remembering, as in piecing together members, the stories of Tasmanian places. These narrative intentions operate dualistically. What we seek to clarify speaks back to us and casts our cultural awareness in new ways. This small cottage has actually taught us a great deal about things we never anticipated might experientially manifest. We feel that more than just accommodating its devoted new owners, it has actually served to clarify an entire spatial tradition which embeds us in our lives and practice here. And like all works which radiate broader cultural intention, the context of this small building bears significantly on the way we've approached its revival. Georgian mannerisms developed out of the late 18th century in England as a reaction against the excesses of the late Rococo and neoclassicism of the continent. Britain was fortifying a sense of increasingly globalised selfhood and developed a fascination with the idea of singular, Palladian-inspired country houses as set pieces in bucolic idols of Britain. A new stoicism and austerity pervaded the ambitions of the British Empire. Georgian tendencies reflected this austerity through undecorated, balanced and finely proportioned buildings, the architectural logic of which was easily transported. There was a fortunate conjunction of the Georgian fashion in architecture and the limited resources of the colonies. There is nothing, waste, nothing wasteful about Georgian buildings. They are functionally dignified and they could achieve this dignity satisfactorily with materials to hand. Georgian tendencies were distributed to the colonies by pattern books, which were huge encyclopedias of building technique and architectural propriety. The principles espoused by these guides were conditioned through the isolation and vulnerability of the colony. Economical, honest and austere, the Vandemonian Georgian is also peculiar. Established in 1821, Oatlands presents as one of the most intact Georgian streetscapes in the country. But like many Tasmanian heritage townscapes, it also harbours an unsettling mystery. In his book Down Home, Peter Conrad wrote, before the engineers thought of diverting rivers and shearing hills, transforming a plateau into a pond and crushing boulders into rocks, all civilization could do in Tasmania was stay indoors and look through its windows at an arboreal screen representing England. To protect, to project, to protect their fiction of rural gentility, the colonists transplanted the landscape they had left. In the Midlands, Georgian country houses shimmer through incongruous, dusty heat. And little girls with riding hats and jodhpurs trot their ponies past the red-whiskered mountain men who are mending the road. But once the view from the landowner's, wi landowner's window stops, the truth of the country reasserts itself. Dry and windy, plains like a, de a desert of spiky grasses, hilltops turned into dunes by the glare, and to confound the oaks with their umbrellas of shade, the presences which dominate everywhere are dead gums twisted in arthritic agonies. This sense has been described as the Tasmanian uncanny, 
and speaks to the unresolved history of exile which saturates the cultural landscape of this island. This notion of the uncanny continually shapes the work of Tasmania's contemporary artists and writers. It speaks of absence and last light in the broad blue expanse of the Tasmanian dusk. It is in this context that we approach the restoration of an archetypal four-pile Vandemonian Georgian cottage. It is important to remember that this small cottage was built in a time when our island had a different name, when the landscape still held the possibility of remnant traditional Aboriginal occupation on the heavily forested horizons of the Midlands Plateau. It was a single isolated structure built in an open and unfamiliar setting for a 70-year-old, 71-year-old Wesleyan expatriate, Jane Payne. For us, it is evidence of a specific cultural and spatial tradition. The cottage has witnessed a long and fascinating social history. The generations of families who occupied this house for nearly two centuries were blacksmiths, carpenters and pastoralists. Although in a state of impending ruin, the fabric of the cottage retained much of its original character. On land granted by Sir John Franklin to Jane Payne in 1842, the cottage was serviced by several outbuildings. Accommodating stores, bathing and additional sleeping areas configured about the original Georgian sandstone core of the house. An initial program of restorative works sought to re-enliven the cottage's Georgian fabric and incorporate contemporary amenity. Decades prior, the northeasterly elevation had collapsed and been patched with asbestos panelling. And a series of lean-tos at the rear were no longer salvageable. The interiors were decaying from lack of light and rising damp. In plan, the cottage was composed of an archetypal four-pile layout with a kitchen annex, which was removed to return the cottage to a more rarefied state of four sandstone elevations. As part of the new works, the footings were underpinned and the collapsing eastern facade was repaired. The asbestos was replaced with two large format windows which formed seats in the depth of the wall. A small bathroom was secreted into the rearmost room adjacent the kitchen, a boot porch at the rear and a retained chimney breast demarcate a courtyard. The internal cruciform walls of the house were originally lined in salvaged timbers and convict pit sawn hardwood boards, presenting a primitive Georgian materiality. Referring to original pattern books, we were conceived of a strategy of timber panelling to clarify the mannerisms of the new work. This approach directly references the tendencies of Georgian room making as a layer of wainscoting inserted to intensify the qualities of the primitive Georgian interiors. Externally, a new steel awning represents the only contemporary intervention to the front facade. And to the east, the new paired windows bring in light and garden aspect. The entry hall shows remnant, original remnant wall fabrics and convict carpentry and the vellum deed from Sir John Franklin to Jane Payne is hung in the entry. The memory of prior generations of blacksmiths and carpenters is recast into the new work through a series of finely crafted mild steel and timber insertions. These insertions provide a delicate scaffold to the rooms. Georgian mouldings have been detailed in unconventional relief to emphasise a quality of social cohesion and continuity with the original fabric of the house. And the scaffold of new furnishing elongates the threshold into the rooms, which preserves the existing structure of the plan and allows the sense of the interior to continually expand between rooms. The original room on the left now serves as the library and it's important to note that the window, the new window is proportioned exactly as the original um, repair. And on the other side of the chimney breast a sitting room. Within the bedroom Timber casement shutters offer a sense of operating the materiality and the history of the room.
and where contemporary amenity is required, it is secreted into the depths of the plan as top-lit spaces for bathing. Remnants of earlier wall coverings were used as a palette for the refinishing of the Baltic pine ceilings in each room, fragments of which remain on the original walls, almost as small leaves of history. We imagined our work as a conversation with the co original convict carpenter, so together we made an opening through history as well as between rooms. The kitchen is furnished with a series of finely crafted mild steel and hardwood insertions, and hardwood crockery shelves carefully calibrate the functionality of a small room, while also referencing the principles of Georgian cabinet making. Cleaved of unsympathetic lean-tos, the section of the house is returned to its original Georgian structure, with a, a later 20th century chimney breast demarcating a working rear yard. A new boot porch was added to provide all-weather access, and the original mid-20th century dado and flooring was recycled and repurposed to create the enclosed porch as a place to prepare for the unpredictable and at times inclement weather of the Midlands. Externally, the chimney breast clarifies a courtyard where site salvaged brick serve as an infill to an archaeological field of sandstone foundations, stoops and hearths. Within the recessed porch, a small bronze bell peels across the garden at lunch. We were fortunate to work with a devoted builder, a father and son, Derek and Russell, who understood the custodial foundation that was being laid by Doug and Allison. As an acknowledgement of the house's social history, Doug and Allison decided to name, it, name the cottage in honour of Stuart Bozen Pennycott, its last generational occupant. I'm very happy that um, a friend of mine's in <laughs> here physically tonight, Pete Hay. So in his Vandemonian essays, Pete Hay writes, what is heritage? Why is it important? I set out to answer these questions and I have found the task surprisingly easy. Heritage, so it seems to me, is that which, inherited from the past, gives meaning to the present. It provides this day with a context in history. It situates the present in a, in a, on a past-present-future continuum and supplies it with identity. The notion of heritage has, if anything, become too portentous, too venerable. It is really a much less encumbered and more humble concept. It is to do with those aspects of the lived-in environment whereby we construct a sense of home. Our home is a field of care, and care entails a steward's responsibility of protection. Doug and Allison's actions as custodians of this small cottage epitomise this sentiment. Through our effort, that is probably my effort as architects, we've tried to establish the threads of a living cultural connection to the spatial tradition offered by the circumstances of practising here. While largely, while largely celebrated, the reception of bosons has also exposed us to the problems of heritage and its contention, which seem to be symptomatic of larger schisms in the cultural heritage sphere and, as, and bespeak a deeper suspicion of the intentions and expertise of my field in particular. Not more than a month after completion, an Instagram post appears from a vocal and influential Tasmanian Cultural Heritage Appraisal Officer calling bosons sad. We take no exception to the feedback from the general public over the efficacy or sensitivity of our work. Always happy to talk. But this public expression of sentiment is from someone who has the power to appraise the promise of our professional endeavour against the statutes of the relevant planning scheme and recommend it or not to the broader community. There is an implication here of heritage as an ideological cudgel. The dialogue continues with other cultural heritage officers around the country. Looks like they've demolished the wall to make one huge, incredibly offensive window, also demolishing an internal wall, fireplaces, etc., and in one of Tassie's special heritage towns. Yes, it's odd. Is the whole house a rebuild, with the old chimney at rear and no front porch or foundation footings? We never had them in Tasmania either. How is that window compatible with this cottage? So many more kind altern alternatives. Good design, question mark. 
This ad, this attitude does not pass with the community's celebration and renew, in the renewal of Bosun's Cottage, nor is it supported by the elation of the family who once called the house their generational home. Truth be told, the works to the exterior of Bosun's were largely repairs, but had this particular cultural heritage appraisal officer been the one to statutorily audit our proposal, safe to say the recommendations to the planning process would have been refusal, garbed in protection of a community's cultural asset. Buildings are not just cultural artefacts. They are nuanced spatial vessels for our living and experiencing. In Tasmania, we risk becoming too focused on the restorations of a, build, of a building's fabric at the expense of its adaptation for our sustained lived experience. Taken conservatively, we suffocate the life out of buildings and compromise our ability to make stories for the future. Poppy and I see nothing sad about our work here or its cultural promise. Rather than strenuously adopting the principles of the Barra Charter, which denies speculation or wonder on the meaning of a building's fabric, we have relied solely on the tenets of our profession, which, I might point out, is far older and far more nuanced in considering matters of human experience and our communal spatial traditions. As I see it, our responsibility is to place emphasis on the reality of our continuing communal occupation of these places, such that ingle nooks open to gardens and the possibilities of being materialise. This small cottage specifically taught Poppy and I that it is possible for four rooms to hold the history of our island. In this way, we work with the original spatial intentions of the fabric, and history becomes as visceral as timber, steel and brick. Thank you. So do we have questions or well, we, we can't have them No, fine. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, well, um unless uh, if there are questions in the room now that we, we we could have that conversation otherwise um <laughs> Uh, uh, so the question was, has the cultural heritage person knocked on um, our door to talk about these things? They haven't, no. I don't think they realise... There was a... a um, uh, of course I responded to the critique. Yes. Um, but it's not been met with a return yet. Okay. But it does, it does raise some really tricky questions because we have here a barrier that professionally um, and, I, and I must also say we, we also work with people in cultural heritage sphere who are exceptional at what they do mm -hmm. and allow us to practice in a way that fully acknowledges um, the possibilities and the promise of our work but there are points where there is such an entrenched and ideological spin. Um, and I think it's evidenced in Hobart, to be honest, because heritage becomes, and they were talking about it last night, it was fascinating, um, in the other forum, talking about how he there are forms of heritage. Peter Lovell made a, fas a really fabulous point about the approaches to heritage in this state being about two orders. One is restorative, which is basically a, muse a, a museum approach of archiving built fabric. And the other is as adaptive reuse, allowing life to seep back into the fabric of the city. Um, and he said that Hobart at the moment sides more to the restorative um, approach. So you end up talking about things like mullions um, with a cultural heritage officer and not talking about the larger structures and narratives which inform our community um, and actually make the heritage mean something. So it becomes a very difficult, and, and, that, and then there is no dialogue beyond that point. They make, make a recommendation to the relevant council and then that gets carried basically to the councillors who make a decision if the, if the 
project um, if the work has to go to that level of arbitration. But it's it's a very um, it's a system that I don't really understand, and we don't operate at that scale um, yet. But it's uh, not something I can certainly in in that uh, in that context where clearly we have poured ourselves into the work and for the for the sake of our clients and the community of that building and that's still not enough or it can be flippantly kind of put aside because the window isn't apparently right for the building um yeah so So what we ended up doing is, where we could, we avoided a planning application. So it was actually repair. We put it in as repair, and that is that is an exemption under the planning scheme. Because I didn't want to be having a conversation necessarily about that, that the interior needed light. I knew that the inside needed sunlight. And so I had to do everything I could to couch, couch an argument, and I can say this now. I had to couch an argument that worked with the nomenclature of the planning scheme which was that it was maintenance and repair, which means that it's uh, not necessarily a D, it's not a DA for that particular part. So um, the demolition of the lean-tos at the rear did, did constitute a DA, but because they were so decrepit and asbestos, it meant that that, was, that just formalised that process. Um, so I'm probably putting my foot in it a bit, but you have you have orders of, of talking when you communicate. The commu what we talked with Doug and Alison about were different things than than the way we talked about it to the cultural heritage officer. Um, so, and again, it changes as you, and also it changes as the, as the work starts to talk back to us. Poppy and I didn't. We knew that this was a great project for some really fabulous people, but we didn't anticipate that it would actually start to talk back to us. One of the things that happened. I'll never forget is we did handover, house is completely empty of furnishing, but the promise of its life was there. And then we came back a week later and Doug and Alison had moved in. And there was a hue and pine mouse in the corners. And they conserved the layers of um, uh, wallpaper and, and put them above the mantle in the library. And the, it, it was the most perfect realisation of the promise of the work and the place smelt of warm baked bread. So we, we from that point, we had really um, resolved that it was, and it's the most magic place to go to. So we, um, we're really proud of it as a project. And so you should be. Mm. That's interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Has the council officers um, commented on the awards? No. They were shown the work by other um, um, council officers, I think, as a kind of example of good practice. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, thank you. Fabulous. Thank you. Thanks very much, guys. Thank yeah. you. I hope everyone who's watching, and particularly there's a lot of people out there online, um, can appreciate the life that Matt and Poppy have breathed into this cottage. Um, and clearly that has been recognised by their peers. Um, and it's clearly um, been given the highest honour um, in architecture this year for a heritage project. So I congratulate you both. But I also thank and congratulate um, Doug and Alison on being wonderful clients and and what can be a you know can be a difficult process but being brave enough to um, to stay with your convictions and the con and to trust the convictions of your architect so architects um, so in closing I would just like to thank our sponsors for open house Hobart they are the city of Hobart the Tasmanian government for Targo Houses Magazine, Access Solutions, Austral Bricks and Lysart. I would like to thank everyone who's here tonight and also everyone for tuning in online. Um, it's been really lovely to hear further stories of the work. My mother's a Pentecost, so I'm really quite interested in this now. Um, and uh, yeah, have a lovely evening. Thank you. <laughs>